Welcome to UC Riverside's College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences 2022 Science Lecture Series on Big Data Science. I'm Madeline Haddad. I'm a second year math major with an environmental science minor, and I am a CNAS Science Ambassador. Before we get started today, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air the Kauia, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, <coughs> students, and staff. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. And now, I would like to bring up Sina, Steen, Catherine, Yurik. Thank you, Maddie, for that introduction. And welcome, everybody, to the 2022 Science Lecture Series on Big Data Science. So today's presentation is a third of four presentations on Big Data Science that we've had this year. And I've been blown away by all, all the presentations so far. So as a recap, for our first presentation, Dr. Stephen Kane talked about search for life in a, a, data, <laughs> a big data universe that we have. Last week's presentation, uh, Dr. Thomas Gerke talked about big data at the intersection of drug discovery and genomics, uh, mining all the drugs that have been out there already and matching that with the uh, genomes. It was pretty amazing. Uh, today we have Dr. Mark Elber, who will talk about the impact of big data informing decision making for the benefit of human health. And next week we're going to have Dr. Francesca Hopkins, who will talk about interpreting big data results and how those observations can help us reach our climate policy goals and ensure equity in the enactment of greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. So quite a wide array of, of science that's being done in CNAS. So just the, the research that's being conducted by our faculty and our students and our staff on, on, on campus is really mind blowing. So there's lots of big science that's happening at, at, at CNAS. I'm supposed to be a grown that happens with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really am enjoying the science lecture series because uh, they, they take on topics that are timely and relevant and highlight how the research being conducted at UCR impacts each and every single one of us and communities across the planet. And I can't wait to learn more about my digital twin today from uh, Dr. Mark Elber. Before we bring up Dr. Elber, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's presentation, Dr. Wei Chao Chen. She has been an assistant professor in the UCR Department of Mathematics since 2017. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Mathematics from the University of Science and Technology of China and her PhD in Mathematics from The Ohio State University, followed by postdoc training at University of California, Irvine. Her research interests include mathematical and computational modeling of biological systems in developmental biology, scientific computing, and numerical methods of partial differential equations. And her research is funded both by NSF and NIH. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wei Tao Chen. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank Dean your, uh, for the introduction and uh, all the people who organized this event. And also uh, thank you all for joining this event, uh, either in person or online. Uh, it was my great honor to be the moderator for today's lecture and introduce our speaker, Professor Mark Elber, who is also my colleague uh, and also a great collaborator on research and a wonderful mentor uh, on my career since I joined the department uh, at Matthew Herman at UCR. Uh, Professor Elber earned his PhD in mathematics at the University of Pennsylvania under the direction of Gerald Marston. Uh, and then he held several positions at the University of Notre Dame, including most recently Vincent J. Duncan, family chair in applied mathematics. He is currently distinguished professor in the Department of Mathematics and uh, director of the Center for Quantitative Modeling in Biology at UC Riverside. Dr. Albert was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2011 and was appointed 2019 honorary Kruseman professor at the Mathematical Institute Leiden University, the Netherlands. He is currently a deputy editor of Plus Computational Biology and a member of editorial boards of Bulletin of Mathematical Biology and the Biophysics Journal. 
His research interests include mathematical and uh, computational multi-scale modeling of blood clot formation, uh, plant development and growth, and uh, epithelial tissue growth. Today, he will give a talk on computational modeling and the uh, digital twin of a patient. Let's welcome Dr. Albert. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Dean Ulrich and uh, Divisional Deal Woodka and college for, for the invitation. It, it means a lot to me. Uh, so I'll try to explain what uh, research been done by our groups at UCR. And I'm representing a large group, which involves a lot of graduate students on our campus as well as undergraduate students. And I'll mention their names in the end of the talk. So uh, I am a participant of a national inter agency modeling and analysis group, which involves uh, uh, members of different teams nationally. And it's run uh, by National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, NASA, Department of Energy. And it was formed more than 10 years ago to introduce uh, multi-scale modeling approaches uh, using supercomputers. To, to study problems in biology and medicine. And three years ago, we had a meeting at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, when we discussed the future of uh, digital twins in healthcare. So what is a digital twin? Uh, so basically, they're pretty common in industry. So uh, they're used for testing uh, engines of uh, airplanes for design. And uh, instead of actually getting sensor data for the whole device, which might take days, if not weeks, for a big uh, airplane, uh, the testing is performed at only a few places, matches with the data obtained for like hundreds of uh, planes before that. Machine learning is used for that. And then they see whether or not uh, certain parts of the engine failing actually uh, might indicate bigger trouble. So before, people used maybe 10,000 of different sensors to see wh how the, the engine is performing. That's kind of important if you ever get on the plane. You want to make sure that the, the engines are working properly. So th this, this is becoming possible because we have supercomputers now. And the largest supercomputers are not just one specific computer. There's a clusters of uh, different processing units run in parallel. And I'll mention this uh, uh, kind of later in my talk. So three years ago, people started seriously thinking about digital twin of a patient to be used in healthcare. So the idea is to collect data about human being from the like, first days after birth, maybe even before birth, and all through the life to, be, to prepare for possible kind of treatment for some developing illness and so on. This has been done for elderly patients already. They're wearing uh, actually sensor devices, right? C can be in the form of a watch, something like that. So they're checking on vital science, but the idea is just to collect like huge amounts of data, and this has been done now, uh, like in everyday life. And then certain algorithms are being developed as we speak to, to come up with a prognosis. And what, what makes the whole setup different from even 10 years ago, development of t methods of artificial intelligence and multi-scale modeling. And multi-scale modeling I'm talking about involves different scales and uh, data uh, to be analyzed at different scales. It's a puzzle. So we need to put it back uh, and kind of figure out what might be wrong with a patient, for example, and so on. And just keep in mind that there is a huge variability. People might be having the same disease, might have the same age, but the prognosis might be different. Depends on certain things. So, as a result of this uh, meeting, we came up with two review papers. And um, if you look at the announcement of the talk, I put them underneath of the description of the talk. 
Uh, so you can get more information about how this modeling efforts using supercomputers and machine learning algorithm efforts all come together uh, to help to build uh, digital twins of individual uh, patients. So uh, what is an artificial intelligence? So it's an attempt, attempt to, to use huge amounts of data to come up with some prognosis. So we're looking at neural network, uh, so we, which are usually used in, uh, in machine learning algorithms, artificial, artificial intelligence algorithms. And it consists of a certain number of nodes connected by some edges. And how they're connected might be chosen to read them initially. But the important thing is these connections between these nodes have weights. Certain numbers indicate, indicating importance. In machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's not clear what these nodes represent. And it's not that important. What's important, there are a lot of them. It can be several million of the nodes. And connections, uh, again, we can try everything. What's important, we have certain inputs, observables. It can be a kind of, uh, say, temperature of a patient taken uh, like every hour. And then, <coughs> of course, there is more than that. And then, uh, kind of, th th these signals are used to, to generate uh, propagation of signal in the neural network. And because of the way they're all connected and the weights are assigned, uh, you get with certain outcomes. So temperature prognosis whether or not the patient has flu, for example. And then you have information about 100,000 patients. And the question is whether the temperature observed in specific interval is a good indication that somebody has a flu. Let's look at COVID. Th this network's been very actively studied to come up with early predictors of serious outcome for a patient with a COVID. So sh shall we look at temperature, breathing, and other components? And I, I remember it's like it was yesterday two and a half years ago, we didn't have any idea what, what to look at. Now we have a very good idea. So these this networks have been set up and uh, uh, people at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and this is where we have the largest computers in the US uh, running uh, this kind of algorithms, setups to, 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 to come up with predictors. So once again, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms are very good to analyzing very large amounts of data in order to make predictions about outcomes. How about answering question, what's happening inside? Why is it happening? Machine uh, learning algorithms, artificial intelligence doesn't answer those questions. For that, we need to go inside and maybe look at components of what's going on. And I'll be giving an example in a second and see how they're connected uh, kind of through physics interactions, biochemical interactions, biological interactions. And then maybe we can come up with a better idea why these predictions are actually true. Why it's important to see what happens inside. We want to, to, to see mechanisms of the processes. Why? We want to develop uh, medications, drugs, to have impact on a specific patient. This represent, represents a specific patient. What, what is better? Just to have some nodes which represent the, this patient in a very abstract way or kind of have this specifically designed for a patient. That's the topic of my, or, uh, my, my, my talk today. So I'll talk about <coughs> specific application. I'm going to talk about blood clotting. So just to compare with <coughs> machine learning algorithm neural network, here this is a diagram of uh, a model of a biological cell. It's coarse-grained molecular dynamic simulation of a cell. We have the whole bunch of nodes as before, but we treat them as physical particles. And they interact with each other through uh, kind of interactions represented by springs. And that can represent, for example, adhesivity of two membranes of two cells or certain potentials, which represent interaction of nodes kind of describing different parts of a cell. So here, we can calibrate this model by applying <coughs> certain forces to a cell. We 
can use uh, certain devices kind of to stretch a cell, let it go back to initial shape, and see whether our simulation is going to reproduce that. This is how you calibrate your model. It's physical. And there are mechanisms uh, uh, which can be represented here. When, we, when you look inside of a cell, it's a universe. It's pretty amazing. Something which is very small has such a complex structure as the universe, which is huge. And it, it's, 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 it's a focus of our college to look inside of cells and look at the universe at the same time. So <clears throat> why I want to talk about blood clots? Uh, actually, it's a leading cause of death in the United States. Gets overlooked uh, because people might have uh, a chronic condition, but they end up dying from blood clots. So clots can, can form in, uh, in the heart, and I'll talk about this in a second. This is directly related to COVID. Or they can form in our legs. And please, when you travel on a plane for a long time, get up every hour and just walk around. Otherwise, you might develop a blood clot. It's this big in the veins, in your legs. And if it gets detached, which happens a lot, it's going to end up in lungs and people die immediately. There is nothing to be done. People with obesity problems might be exposed to this danger. People uh, actually, a lot of people survive cancer of different kind at this point. But the treatment might result in pathological clotting. And they might just develop a clot and die from that surviving cancer, which is not fair, right? So it's really important to study this. Uh, there is no one disease. It's a condition. Blood circulating all over our body is extremely important. And blood clotting is important. So next time you cut yourself, don't do this on purpose, right? Blood comes out and kind of coagulates and clogs the injury site. So it stops bleeding. We wouldn't be able to survive without blood clotting mechanism if it works properly. Unfortunately, in, in, in patients with specific diseases, such as COVID, blood starts coagulating for no obvious reason. A lot of younger patients with COVID develop uh, inflammation of the heart. This re results in formation of very small blood clots in the heart, uh, and they shoot up into the brain, and people get paralyzed. So blood clots. Uh, they are the cause of uh, stroke, unfortunately. So people in their 20s uh, can develop uh, clot. So, so on the positive side, uh, there is a lot of effort being kind of applied to, to studying the, how to deal with these clotting problems. Uh, you can go to the website of the, one of the NIH institutes, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. They update description of what's been done in this area. That's their website address. And this is basically what clot is all about. So I'm going to show you uh, actually movies of real clots in a second. But basically, uh, they, they, form, uh, they can form inside of blood vessels as well as outside. And uh, uh, so they consist of smaller cells circulating in blood called platelets, thrombocytes, and also uh, fibrin network. It's like a gel. So in case if there is some injury site or cut, uh, uh, blood coagulates. So, so, so basically, these injured cells produce certain signals, like alarm signals, okay? Do something. And platelets, and the signals actually diffuse in, into bloodstream, and platelets kind of, kind of sitting there waiting, okay? They get activated as a result of response to the signaling. They become irregular in shape, very adhesive, stick together, and they, they, they get attached to the injury site. It's a kind of initial plug. So every patient, every person who gets into a car accident, right, is supposed to just stay there on the ground. And then the, the most cases they're taking to the hospital to check for internal bleeding. So depending on, on extension of internal wounds, um, it's either clotting is going to help, and if they're extensive, uh, they don't help. So bleeding into a tissue is deadly. OK. So I'll skip this one. So looking at actually experimental movie in real time, so uh, our collaborators uh, ran experiments in very small blood vessel, E of a mouse. 
So they, they shoot laser, create a small injury site here. And then uh, you see different types of cells start fluorescing. It's called confocal microscopy. So certain markers have been used for that. Uh, uh, start fluorescing in different colors. Let me explain the colors. So red is plasma, the liquid in our bloodstream. Uh, the, the, there are darker cells, the, the uh, larger cells present in blood, red blood cells. And these green things are activated platelets. They get activated only after that they start fluorescing in green. You see they form small clusters and they initially adhere to the injury site. And as a part of activation, they start coagulation pathway reactions in blood. And uh, fibrinogen present in blood polymerizes into fibrin network. It's a network which actually gives the structure to this gel. Otherwise, the, the whole clot would be actually moved away uh, just due to sheer pressure from, from the bloodstream. The way clots are forming in the heart or blood vessels close to the heart in our, in our legs, they're different, depends on the speed of the, of the blood in specific blood vessels. So, here you're looking at a reconstructed 3D image of the same clot uh, in time. It's the same clot, co colors are slightly different. Red, these are activated platelets. And then fibrin is, uh, is uh, in, in green and plasma, it's, uh, it's blue. So confocal microscopy uses laser technology and it kind of scans the, the specific piece of tissue. In this case, it's a blood clot. And, uh, uh, and then we used certain reconstruction techniques using machine learning to, to get this structure. So uh, if you take a slice of a network, you get points, right? Just think about it. And then you have the whole bunch of points for different levels of slicing. How you reconstruct branches of a network? So it appears we, it was possible to, to train artificial intelligence algorithm using a lot of samples to recognize the network and make it different from, from uh, activated platelets and so on. So artificial intelligence machine learning is a very powerful way of looking for patterns in data. So in this case, pattern is the structure of a blood clot. How much of it consists of activated platelets? How much of it is a fiber network? Sometimes we see uh, uh, very large blood cells sitting inside and they undermine structural stability of the clot and so on. Okay, so in order to, to look at uh, kind of mechanistic description of what's going on. Uh, we developed several models at different scales. Now I'm talking about multi-scale computational modeling. In the end, I'll bring two, two approaches together. So here, we kind of look at the clot from a distance. We, we're not gonna try to, to account for each individual cell or small piece of a network. We just want to represent all cells as a specific type of a specific type of a, uh, of liquid so we're using so called multi phase model it's very viscous every type of liquid uh, but at, at the same time th these models can be easily implemented and actually uh, they they don't take a lot of uh, computer time to run so the blue is the fluid you don't see it, but it's flowing, okay? And clot consists of uh, fluid representing a density of activated platelets, somewhere in the middle, this is how we start. And then the, the, the fiber network starts with a like, certain amount, it's blue, and interaction with the fluid results in extensions of the clot into the blood vessel. This is a computational blood vessel. Okay, so these extensions are called emboli. So we're modeling embolization, and, and, and I, I ran this experimental movie and uh, under very similar conditions to, to the previous movie, and you saw these extensions. I can run it again. 
here it's actually, yeah. You, you see the extensions are going this way. Uh, this is how people die. Actually, when clots are formed in, in our legs, um, they, they are very extended, extended objects. And this big extensions, and this, as we speak, th this emboli, these extensions just keep on extending. So the point, point they are too long and they get disconnected from the rest of the clock, cl clot. After that, after that, it's anybody's guess. They travel through blood vessels, end up in lungs, and people die immediately, unfortunately. And this happens in the middle of the night, and there is no indication of that. So, so the, of course, people have been running uh, different tests, usually biochemical tests of blood. The blood is drawn, and some components are determined. People looked at uh, platelets, and uh, there are different ways of preventing this from happening. So uh, drugs called uh, blood thinners, they basically interfere with uh, <coughs> adhesivity of platelets. They don't stick together too much. But if you use this drug, there is a danger of uh, developing uh, actually uh, embolisms in, in the brain. What if your patient is five years old? There are a lot of kids being born with genetic defects nowadays, which predispose them to blood cloning, and we don't know why. And you don't want to give your patient uh, who's five years old uh, a very powerful drug. So this model has been used to, to test different scenarios for preventing uh, kind of clot developing this uh, extensions. So by looking at uh, experimental movies, running our own simulations, and matching the profiles using machine learning algorithms, we were able to, to, to make very specific predictions. Like for example, uh, if the clot uh, has uh, a low permeability, ability to, to, to let blood go through it, that's permeability, then it actually has a high um, chances of developing this embolize, and they're very dangerous. Uh, we can look at that what happens with the clot from a mechanical point of view. This is why it's important to use physics for, for studying biological phenomena. And stresses are important because this small clot might just explode if the, the tension is just right. Okay, and they explode basically. They grow to, do, to, to be too big, too irregular in shape, and uh, everything is a result of evolution. So something went very wrong in specific patient and they start developing this irregular uh, clots with irregular structure. Uh, so the main result I want to mention here, we developed a new computational test. So we can we draw blood from a patient and grow very small blood clot in microfluidic device, use confocal microscopy, the imaging technique I just mentioned. And we, we get the structure, we make it digital by calibrating computational multi-scale model. And then we can put the structure into any blood vessel in our body and see whether this clot is going to survive there, whether it's going to develop emboli and so on. Um, so I talked about macro scale, looking at a distance. How about we try to get as close as possible to, to clot and see what happens at the very edge of the clot. So we developed uh, so-called uh, subcell element models, coarse-grained molecular dynamics simulations. Um, and you're looking at two platelets floating in, in fluid, actually blood, actually bumping into each other and adhering to each other. But they, because of the mechanical properties, they kind of dissociate. But this was calibrated uh, using uh, specific experimental data. So ca what can we do with model which was calibrated this way. And by the way, you see there are nodes there, but they're physical nodes, they interact with each other. It, these are not machine learning uh, neural network nodes. They represent part of, of a cell, which is very different from very abstract way this is, uh, this is done in machine learning. So using this representation, we were able to predict why kids with um, deficiency in factor seven actually develop uh, 
actually having prob problems developing stable clots. So we were able to show that uh, uh, the fibrin network doesn't form properly. There is a delay in polymerization, and uh, we made this prediction, and we, we, we suggested how to genetically modify mouse to reproduce this deficiency in kids. And you're looking at experimental images. This is normal, and this is abnormal with deficiency factor seven. You see, fiber network doesn't form prof uh, properly. This is not stable, Get, gets washed away. Uh, okay. So, so we always go back and forth between experiment and simulations. And with our collaborators from uh, School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania, we uh, decided to get as close as possible to individual platelets inside of a clot. And uh, we, we, we also looked at so-called clot contraction. Clot, it's a very interesting piece of tissue. It's a soft tissue. It's formed for specific function to prevent uh, actually blood loss. At the same time, it has its, its own lifespan, and platelets, which are instrumental to forming a clot, actually dissolve it after the, the healing of the wound starts. But what is it platelets do in order to coordinate uh, uh, activities with each other? Do, do platelets talk to each other? What do you think? These are very small cells. Do, what do you think? They communicate. They cannot talk, they communicate. Usually cells communicate through chemicals. They express chemicals, produce chemicals, and then other cells respond to that. Th this little guys actually use mechanics. So this is what we, we notice at high resolution. You are looking at one platelet attached through filopodia, these extensions. I told you they become irregular in, in, in shape. They have these extensions called filopodia hands. And they kind of get attached to individual fibers, and they start pulling on them. So we, 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 we decided to spend time watching them. Why are they doing this? So here we're looking at the whole image. Uh, so fiber network is fluorescing in red, and the green ones, uh, th these are platelets with this extension, so you can see them, right? Th they're just platelets, and this is, uh, we removed platelets uh, Use machine learning to remove them from images. And then the, the, these are the changes in the fiber network. You're not going to believe it. They do this, and they tie a knot. And they, they, they have like seven, eight different extensions, and they attach to different fibers, and they do this again and again. They produce a little rug. And they're sitting on this rug, and they become much more powerful in pulling. And the way they pull on a, on a fiber, it, it depends on the stress in the fiber. So if there is another platelet on the other side of the fiber using uh, its uh, uh, filopodia on that other side, they know. Why? They, they, something is not letting them pull as hard as they want. And they pull harder, and the whole thing contracts. And this is very important. When the clot is formed under normal conditions, it needs to withstand pressure from the flow and the higher is the flow, uh, the more pressure is on individual platelets. They get activated through pressure as well. So they develop more filopodia, start pulling with high, higher force and so on. The whole thing contracts to the right structure and uh, shape to withstand pressure from the flow. This is a smart material. So we can learn from it, among other things, if it works properly. So this contraction is very important. And what's the kind of the, the basic mechanism? It's just individual platelets pulling on fibers and talking to each other this way. So we decided to, to, to look at bigger picture, okay? So we know what individual platelets do. How about we put like several hundred of them together and see whether we can get some contraction of, uh, of a clot under reasonable time. So this is a mechanistic multiscale model. So we represent uh, individual platelets uh, as spheres, and we have filopodium, and we kind of use springs to, to represent like mechanics of it and so on. 
And uh, then we have very detailed model for individual fibers and so on. And then we first ran simulations for just fiber in network without cells. And we, we made a small discovery there. And of course, in order to calibrate this model, we, we looked at like hundreds of uh, experiments, used machine learning algorithms to determine parameter values for the model. This is a model simulation. And uh, you see the color indicates level of stress. And we, we predicted that the right distribution of stresses happens only if fibers actually interact with each other when they get very close to each other. We predicted the force of this interaction. And this is important because after clots are formed and say stretched on the flow, or they can be stretched in our brain after clot goes there, uh, we would like to have a medication used which would dissociate them and would decrease the, the, the pressure. All, all medications so far have been kind of mostly designed for platelets, but uh, now there is a way to go into the patient brain and take out a clot, suck out a clot. So we're getting samples from real patients. They mostly uh, consist of fibrin. There are no platelets there. So the modern drugs are not very helpful with that. So figuring out that the interaction between fibers is very important, and we made this first prediction. And th this is a full simulation of uh, contracting clot. So you see these platelets, you have the, the, these extensions, you see fibers get actually stressed out and so on, and the whole thing is contracts. So it's mechanistic. mechanistic. You see motion and interaction of, of nodes, which is very different from machine learning, right? But in order to find the, the right way for this uh, forces to be applied, we analyzed a lot of e imaging data from real experiments and simulations. Tens of thousands of simulations. We, uh, we run the simulations on supercomputers. So there's a sub supercomputer in La Jolla, and we have a very large uh, computer cluster on this uh, campus. We use graphical cards uh, to, to run simulations. This simulation takes like a week to run. OK, uh, so this simulation kind of represents every fiber. And this is more extensive simulation for a different type of a clot. But you see it contracts. So they, they actually, it's not just the whole thing contracts. Uh, platelets aggregate, they cluster, which helps them to, to, to start pulling with higher force. Something is very smart happening. Not because each cell is smart, because all of them collaborate and produce pattern of behavior, which results in this unbelievable behavior of this uh, piece of, uh, I call it tissue. And for, for each human, it, it's been, it's been it's set up in a very specific way for, for specific blood flow rate and the rest of it. So in order to so this simulation is very similar to what we've seen before. But uh, he, here we're, we're trying to figure out which interactions, which fibers actually matter. And we used, uh, again, artificial intelligence using a lot of uh, simulations to figure out which ones. So we kind of cleaned out most of them. But you see wh what really matters. What is the backbone of the clot, a piece of uh, soft uh, tissue? And that's very important. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so, uh, so this is what was done. And uh, I, I kind of pointed to uh, the importance of using uh, machine learning and uh, multiscale modeling together, resulting in some new ideas either for uh, testing uh, outcomes for specific patients or uh, this might help with development of specific drugs, new type of drugs. So at this point, we, we started new collaboration on uh, kind of studying blood clotting and wound healing. So it's not, th it's not just a plug. When you cut yourself, don't do this on purpose again. Blood comes out, coagulates, and forms a cover. This clot forms a cover. 
which actually helps uh, with uh, actually with wound healing. So, so the edges of the wound cells there start behaving in different way because platelets actually contribute to that. And uh, so, so the, the, the possible application is just uh, uh, an introduction of uh, new types of, uh, I wouldn't call it artificial, artificial skin, but uh, type of a skin consisting of real cells which can help with, uh, to help uh, burn victims big time. So platelets are really important there. So let me mention members of the team. And uh, so Francesca Pancaldi was a postdoctoral associate at UCR. And Dr. Litvinov, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Weisel. Uh, they are biophysicists slash biologists from University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Uh, this is my collaborator, Julian Shu from Notre Dame. And there's the two uh, UCR students, Christian Michael and uh, Sam Britton. Britton finished already working for Ira Space Company in Los Angeles, using this kind of simulations to come up with new ideas how to navigate large number of drones. Uh, so to finish by kind of putting in one couple of slides, what kind of data is needed to, to, to bring together machine learning and multi-scale? So on the experimental side, experiments are run in vitro, uh, in, uh, in, uh, just with cell cultures, okay? And certain things can be learned about cells. But then if you really want to, to study tissue level outcomes of interactions between cells, you need to start looking at animals at this point uh, mice. And it's already multi-scale. Single scale, uh, that's what happens inside of one cell. Multi-scale when you look at the tissue. And then, uh, of course, uh, human data is not as available as animal data for obvious reasons. So for example, we cannot study people with acute uh, blood clotting uh, uh, conditions because they've been treated. We're treating every patient, right? We don't wait with treatment. Treatment changes the physiology. As soon as you start using very powerful drugs, your predictions need to be adjusted to that. Uh, but basically, uh, predictive modeling is based on machine learning and multiscale modeling, mechanistic multiscale modeling, and you go back and forth all the time. Uh, this is a big diagram in one of the two papers uh, I recommended, which we wrote, kind of gives you a bigger picture of what's going on. And uh, just want to, to spend a couple of minutes talking about my campus, right? So, so a lot of people who, who participated in this project as well as other projects are members of the Center for Interdisciplinary Center for Quantitative Modeling and Biology. Uh, most of them have offices in the new multidisciplinary building. And where our field is called mathematical computational biology, computational science. And we're sitting on the third floor next to, to faculty members and students working in data analysis, big data. We produce a lot of big data uh, through our simulations computations. They, they just work with any data given. So we complement each other. So I want to invite everybody who didn't visit this building before, please come and visit. And it's in the middle of campus, and it's just beautiful. It's high tech, especially incoming students. Please let us know, we'll just take you on the tour. A lot of lab space, uh, biologists uh, working on different applications in medicine and biology. Uh, <clears throat> also want to mention that one of the events this center organized, and it's like four years old, we, we held uh, virtually, unfortunately, uh, last year, a very large conference, kind of virtually on this campus. Uh, it, wa it was an annual meeting of Society for Mathematical Biology with more than 2,500 people, uh, our participants from all over the world. We ran a 24 hour cycle and uh, people from Asia and people from uh, other parts of the world, Europe, kind of 
uh, working together and dis discussing uh, how to merge uh, artificial intelligence and multi-scale modeling. And I just want to mention some of the sponsors. So we established connections to some leading, or leading uh, companies, Merck, Pfizer, 10X Genomics, on uh, Amgen, on pharmaceutical side, and we're hoping to develop m more contacts, and we're establishing uh, new collaboration with uh, quite a few of them. We would like to do it for our graduate students and, of course, for our undergraduate students. This is what I've been talking about is called high tech, okay? And it's, it's very relevant to, to the studies uh, performed by pharmaceutical companies and just high tech companies. And uh, thank you. Okay, that was a really great talk. Uh, now it is our Q&A session. Uh, we already received a bunch of questions from the online audience. Uh, and uh, I think we will go over some of those first. And uh, for the in-person audience, if you have any question, feel free to raise hand. And uh, I think if we have time, then uh, we will go over those yeah, as well. So Dr. Albert, the uh, first question come from uh, Lizzie, uh, how did you come up with the mathematical model? Was it based on a previous model or something that was done from scratch? So in this case, it, it was done from scratch because this is a new modeling approach, uh, a subcell element model, but uh, with, with this application to blood clotting. But we're using the same modeling approach for studying plants. So we're also studying stem cells in plants and stem comes from a plant. So first stem cells uh, to be studied came from plants. We're trying to figure out why, why plants kind of grow up and up and up. So it's the same modeling approach, but completely different uh, biological mechanisms. So it's a, it's a new application of a approach, but the way it was developed is very new. Okay, thank you. And the, the second question, uh, asked by Jia, who is an uh, incoming student for this fall uh, in, the co uh, in our college. Uh, welcome to UCR, Jia. Uh, so the question is, uh, I'm very interested in advancing my knowledge on this subject. May you clarify how blood clots form and uh, what its symptoms are? So, so they, they can form for different reasons. Uh, usually they form in the bloodstream as a result of any kind of a cut or inflammation. And inflammation is caused by immune system. So in, in, in COVID patients, uh, viruses interfere with epithelium and gets inflamed b because the immune system overreacts. As soon as this happens, clotting is just developing. Clots are de developing very rapidly and they, they get washed into bloodstream and that's not good, deadly actually. So that, that's a manifestation of clotting. It's when clots are formed, they don't dissolve for a long time. They keep on growing, get irregular in size. Big pieces get detached, travel in our body, end up in the brain or lungs. Nothing to be done, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question uh, by Vincent. Uh, how can the progression and the growth of the abnormal blood clots be predicted, I guess, by the mo model? And what solution or course of action would you take to combat your predicted growth? Right, so, so uh, on the positive side, th there is a large number of uh, medications available to deal with clotting. Uh, just most of them are targeting platelets, as I, I mentioned before. So there is a new class of uh, drugs being developed to deal with uh, fibrin network. Th this is very novel. Uh, so drugs are available. It just, there are risks which come with applying these drugs. So one of them, uh, blood might not be uh, uh, coagulating properly. So, so uh, there might be some bleeding occurring in the brain. It's like it's a balancing act. And then it depends on specific patient. If a patient is having like heart problems, so as I mentioned before, maybe I didn't, diabetes. People with diabetes are at very high risk of developing blood clots. Elderly people, aging contributes to that. 
you need to get as much information as possible about patients like this, store them somewhere, and just look at it. Uh, so my father was a mathematician. My, my mother was a pathologist, medical doctor. And she spent her life looking at uh, different cancerous cells. <laughs> so she used to tell me any help provided by, by looking at um, large amounts of data would really benefit her diagno diagnostics. It just now we have access. We've been accumulating data for 10, 15 years for patients now. You see system, we're sharing information about data not with public, with other researchers and medical doctors. But now we can actually look at what happened with patients with that level of clotting before, what medication was used, what were the outcomes. So long-term outcomes, that's what matters. And now, now actually machine learning uh, is, has been very helpful with that. Okay, uh, I really like the next question by Cassie, uh, who is uh, actually a high school student. Uh, so. Uh, what advancements are being made regarding the use of the digital twin? Uh, you discussed the technology being used regarding blood clots. However, could these technologies be transferred to further understand other conditions and diseases such as cancer or genetic disorders? So, so uh, one of the causes of blood clotting is a genetic disorder. So people are looking at other genetic disorders in early development, for example, and that's what we've been actually looking at uh, with uh, Dr. Chen, collaborating on that. Uh, so, so at the same time, how to put it? Uh, one has to be careful <laughs> with, with machine learning. This is why uh, actually mechanistic modeling is very important. Science matters. Machine learning, it's mostly statistics, some mathematics definitely, and computer science. Science matters, medicine matters, experience of humans matters. So this is, this is a tool, but uh, different uh, clinicians will be using it in a different way. Uh, so, so, so people like me or like us have meetings and we talk about it. There are ethical issues which I didn't mention. What if we make prediction based on machine learning or computational modeling? Can we actually disclose this prediction to a specific patient? Well, uh, the, 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 the opinion of the community, of, of medical community is, if this is ever allowed, this will be disclosed as consultation with specialists. Was I trained in medical field? field? No, I wasn't. What are the uh, kind of uh, levels of error in, in computational modeling? Can be 5%, can be 25%. So the, the, the personally, the way I see, there will be a new generation of medical students and science students trained to work together to develop this technology. But uh, the, the first application of digital twin technology, which comes to mind, is actually COVID. This algorithm has been used for, for predicting outcomes of serious cases of COVID. And regardless, or regardless of like blood clotting, just just we, we we now have data for millions of people, and we know how they were treated and what was the outcome. So that that would be the the main kind of success, I would say, of digital twin at this point. Yeah, we also have a question related to COVID. Uh, you said that one of the COVID symptoms and the effects are blood clots. Are there any other symptoms that you? Uh, hope to tackle, especially now that more knowledge of the virus has surfaced. So interestingly enough, we looked at the mechanism of formation of a virus with our collaborator from physics, uh, Professor Roya Zandi. So and she, she's one of the leading authorities in uh, kind of uh, mechanisms of formation of, of, of viruses. So, so I don't know how much you know about viruses, they're not real cells, <laughs> they're small pieces of DNA. They use human cells for, for replication and they kind of go to the membrane and uh, there is a budding of the membrane happening, a small bubble forms and then this DNA gets inside. Millions of these bubbles float around. Hope nothing in this room. Okay, and then it, it gets to the epithelium and this is how it spreads. So we, we have a model actually of, uh, for, for kind of studying mechanism of formation of one 
uh, virus. And there is a hope to interfere and prevent this from happening and on a cellular, at a cellular level. Uh, Laura asked, are there any ethical concerns in using computational devices to simulate cellular mechanisms? Huge, huge. So, so, so each um, campus has a committee, eth ethics committee, right? We have it on our campus. So any exper experiment which involves human cells can involve studies of HIV or uh, pathogens gets through, through that uh, committee and it's very strict there are ethical rules how it should be done who can do it whether students can be exposed to this kind of research there are levels of safety for uh, assigned for to specific labs and this is very strict nothing is done for computational modeling we're having impact on how biologists run experiments but personally as a part of this project, I was the PI on the NIH grant. I was trained in ethics. And I'm trying to, 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 to teach my students and students in our department ethics. It's a very unusual idea for somebody in mathematics. But, but fields are merging. Physics and mathematics and chemistry, they, they merged for a long time. I, I, I want to speak up also in support of pure mathematics, which is also extremely important kind of uh, a lot of computational things I was talking about uh, are working because there are deep mathematical reasons for that. Like system of equations do have solutions and they have unique solutions. You can run numerics on computers and it can be very misleading if there is very deep mathematical justification for this. I'm very excited our campus on this campus, our department on this campus, mathematics department. Okay, one more question from the online audience. What are several security protocol measures scientists or data scientists can take to ensure sensitive patient data and information are not compromised or leaked? So uh, there are certain protocols uh, uh, which people use when they're releasing data. So names are removed. Uh, I, I would say there are legal issues, obviously. So, uh, so specific medical schools are reluctant to, to release data to scientists like me, only because I collaborate with them directly. I mentioned the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I signed some forms and uh, th they actually paying attention to how this data is stored. So in our building, we have a room, it's called Secure Room under el electronic uh, key. This is where we look, uh, we're supposed to look uh, and we're looking at patient-specific data. The, I would say th th this has been preserved uh, as much as we can, and uh, there are laws about it. So, But my, my concern is more and more data will be involved in deve developing digital twins. That needs to be addressed, uh, including security issues. Okay, uh, due to the time limit, uh, we have to conclude today's lecture here. Uh, we actually received more questions from the audience. Please feel free to check our website or contact our speaker, Dr. Alber, after the lecture. And don't forget our last big data science presentation by Professor Hopkins uh, will be next Tuesday, the same time. And also, if you miss any uh, previous lectures, please check our website and also the YouTube channel. Thank you all and uh, have a good evening.